Let's talk until then. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for joining me for this discussion or dialogue. So, well, uh, thank you for reaching out. Um, uh, you know, and I, I, I enjoyed uh, when we when we did the empathy circling, uh, Peter, Jason, uh, and I and you. And so when you reached out and said, I think we need to uh, bring you sort of empathy into the discussion, especially on the on the project that I'm engaged on now, the After Socrates series, I thought, yeah, Edwin just made a good point. So I thought we, doing it together in dialogue also seemed appropriate. Uh, so thank you for inviting me and proposing this. Yeah, and I appreciate your openness to dialogue. I've been watching a lot of your dialogues and you're just, you're willing to talk with everyone. So <laughs> I appreciate that mindset and that attitude because I think that's really what we need going forward is kind of that openness just to... Yeah, yeah. I, I think that... I mean, I'm willing to talk to anybody that will come. They can disagree with me. Uh, Paul Van der Clay, Jonathan Pajot often disagree with me. Uh, but I have a tremendous amount of affection and respect for them because I trust them because they come into difficult dialogue uh, with, uh, with, you know, in good faith. We, we've lost what that meant, right? But they come in in good faith. They come in with, no, no. I'm going to be open to self-correction and to insight. We're going to disagree, but I'm also going to come in with sort of a reverence for the real possibility that I will learn something from you and you will transform me in ways that I can't foresee or anticipate or do on my own. And when people come in with that sort of orientation, I, then I want to talk to them. I want to talk to them. When they come in, when they have an ax to grind, then they want to prove their point. Then it's like, uh, I have a place where I do that. And that's, let's go into the scientific academy and we can argue, you know, particular theories there. There's a way of doing that. And though I try to, you know, that other than that, I kind of don't want to talk to people. But thankfully, mm -hmm. thankfully, uh, I find a lot of people in uh, both domains uh, that I can talk to uh, effectively and, and I think uh, productively. Well, I actually like to talk with the people from that have very, who you say are bad faith, but to do it in an empathy circle. Right. With right. the empathic listening structure. And we, we bring together people on the political left, political right. Exactly. Talk about topics like abortion, you know, whatever. But they have to follow a, a structure where they have to do that empathic listening, which you, you know, took part in. So as long as there's that rule, I, it's like anybody, I'm glad to talk with anybody. Because it, it kind of makes sure people actually listen to each other instead of just start it's throwing stuff past. at each other. Yeah. But that's one of the, I think we could slow down here because I want to I want to zero in on this because there's one of the things I'm interested right now to talk to you about. Uh, because I think the, the difference you pointed to, is, because I see Socrates as doing both what I said at the beginning about that, but Socrates is also doing something analogous to what you did. That's the midwifery that he talks about. He says that he's like a midwife because one of the things you, uh, I think, if I miss, if I get this wrong, but it seems like you're saying, that one of the things that the empathy circling do, does is transition people into good faith dialogue mm -hmm. out of, uh -huh. out of yeah. out. right. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that's a missing, and I think, uh, so I think your critique or criticism, whichever way you want to put it, that I have not sort of looked more at empathy or empathy circling, uh, and, and there's, it's a missing piece. I, I want to acknowledge that. You should know, uh, just so just to be explicit, I'm going to directly talk about empathy circling in the After Socrates series. Uh, the first half of the series is about the, the you know the historical development of dialectic, but I want to put that, if you'll allow me the pun, into dialogue with all these new emerging uh, practices around trying to get to authentic dialogue. And I think the think, I mean, I think what you've I, I, I think what you just said is really important. In fact, one of the things that when Peter, Peter Lindbergh, who's mm -hmm. also, right. and I right. talked about after, because we said like, because we're doing a bunch of these modalities, right? And it's all participant observation. And what, what we talked about, and Peter had this uh, metaphor for it, which I think is really good. He said, it felt like the empathy circling was sort of training a different muscle mm -hmm. than some of the other, and all, they each sort of be tr seeming to train different things. And I said to him, I said, I wonder and if they could be put into sort of a programmatic relationship. Um, and I, I hope you don't take this as as as, uh, as being to, trying to diminish uh, the importance of empathy circling. I'm trying to do the opposite in my mind, which is that, that empathy circling is this great thing for transitioning people into um, good faith dialogue. And then maybe that could, so, so you would perhaps need to get good training 
in empathy circling before you could go into sort of the kind of circling that Guy Sendstock talks about, which is much more when people are capable, not just willing or wanting, but also capable of entering into deep good faith dialogue, then you can sort of, sort of do this extra stuff with it. So I, yeah, that's, that's exactly I, yeah how I see it is that the empathy yeah. circle is sort of a gateway practice, but Excellent. it is this foundational gateway practice that is uh, it's like anybody can do it with sort of a minimal uh, right exactly stuff. exactly and then which means it can spread very widely, which is sort of the thing I've been focusing on is how do we sort of spread this practice you know throughout the culture is it something anyone in the culture can do and just by observing it if we can have like politicians if we could have yeah, yeah, you know yeah. like when uh when uh uh not trump pelosi schumer and pence were in this in the oval office and they were having this you know banter yeah, between yeah. each other I remember that if they would have done an empathy circle with each other it it's like the yeah. whole country would have seen it and they could have picked it up and it would be like that. So if you can model it, people can pick it up. And it's this gateway to all those different practices that you're, I think that yeah. you're talking about, that whole constellation of practices. And it's like making it deeper. But that's why I really focused on, on this. And yeah, okay, actually, our, to our topic actually is like, what is the role of empathy in your, your work? So I haven't heard it, you know, mentioned. Uh, I don't have, they really haven't talked about empathy. And I think it's really a foundational practice. And and you had sent, uh, you know, just said, well, maybe we should start off by like, what are we talking about when we're well, good, mentioning good. empathy, right? It's like, what is the te definitions that we're talking about? Because it is a bit of a mess out there in it, the academic it, world it, 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 in terms which, of what people are calling empathy. There, and I sent you that article, that paper by totally, Dan totally. Batson. He lays it out pretty well, you know, just the, a basic framework yeah. for it. So well, uh, it's so, a good starting point. I think it is. So two points on that. The first, um, the mini, I mean, this is a, this is a prevalent problem in psychology where the same term is used in multiple different ways. And so that really, that really makes the problem of equivocation a deep problem in psychology. And so I have avoided the term empathy. Perhaps I was mistaken, but maybe not. It looks to me from the outside and the article you sent me sort of signs to support this, that there are many different meanings um and they don't they are of this term and so that's why i hesitated in using it um and you know and and some particular meanings have come onto very strong criticism like the criticism that bloom has made i know you have responses to that mm -hmm. i'm just trying to explain why i sort of held off in using the term because it mm -hmm. struck me like mm -hmm. what people like what what am i saying when i invoke this term uh, either i spend a lot of time like trying to stipulate it or i just i just i, I put it aside now um Here's an opportunity to actually give it the foregrounding that it needs. But the second thing I'd like to bring into that defining is I want a definition that makes focal and central the very thing you just put your finger on a few minutes ago. I want a definition of empathy that helps me explain the transition from bad faith to good faith dialogue. So I'm, I, I want to reverse engineer empathy from that important, and I think you agree, that central function that we as deeply needed today. Or, I, I, so I'm gonna be a little bit bold here, Edwin. If there's a definition of Ed, uh, there's a definition coming from Edwin that doesn't tell me, you know, explain how empathy gets people from bad faith to good faith dialogue, I'm not that interested in it. Uh, because I think we have the shared idea that, no, this is really, really needed right now. And I think is really central to, as you also seem to agree, with a lot of important projects. So. Let's open up what it means, but I want to keep this function the central thing. I want to understand what is empathy, and the explanation is such that it explains to me this function of taking people from bad faith to good faith dialogue. Is that, mm -hmm. is that fair? Yeah, yeah, I think that? that's great. Yeah, because there's a, there's a practicality to that, too, yes, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, it, yeah. this is a practical definition. It's not just, you know, whatever. Yes, yes. It's like, because this is something we can use. And that's what I, I really appreciate about the value of empathy is the practicality of it. And because I, I see it all the time. Like, you know, I do empathic listening with people. Uh, yeah. I do mediation. And it's the empathy that's sort of the key ingredient for, you know, bridging that meaning crisis, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, and so the, the work I do is pretty much based on work of Carl Rogers. So mm -hmm. he had definitions. I'd sent you that definition. Yes, I saw that. Uh, of empathy. You know, he has a, you know, a, I think a really a paper and he gave it, he presented the paper 
Uh, you know, he gave his definitions, he laid it out. He spent like 40 years doing empath, you know, developing empathic listening uh, in a therapeutic context and, you know, promoted it. So it's his work. And at the core, it's kind of the most simple definition uh, or is a metaphor of going on someone else's journey with them. Yeah, yeah. So I am going, I'm sitting here, I'm looking, you're kind of going, I'm speaking, you're following my journey, right? It's like yeah, you're yeah. present with me. I can feel you being present, you know, sensing into uh, what I'm saying. And, you know, and you're, you're going on my journey. You're not saying, no, you're wrong. You're this. You might be thinking some things, but you still have that presence. And so you're going on my journey. And then also the other part I would say is the empathy. I like to define empathy within the context of an empathy circle too. Of so course. That we, that we have something tangible that we're defining it with. Yeah. So, so like here that. it is. You, you've, been, you're, you've been following me. And then it's like, okay, now I'm going to follow you. Right? Right, we're going right. to switch. I'm going to empathize with you and follow you on your journey and, okay. and hear okay, you. Yeah. So that's, that's just the sort of a start. That's just the starting point. No, but that's great. Okay. So that, 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 thank you. That brings up a couple of points I want to, first of all, I like this idea of sort of, you know, participating in somebody's other sort of, there's, there's a sort of what I would call perspectival knowing, like, and, and, and that leads to a point that I think I want to explicate and draw out from your work that you aren't thinking of empathy as just an affective state. You're thinking of, if I'm following your journey, the way you're talking about, I'm not just having sort of the same affective state. I'm also trying to see how you're making sense of things. If I'm following your journey, there's a deeply cognitive aspect to this project. It's not just an affective response. And I think that's important because many of the definitions, you know this, many of the definitions of empathy reduce it to a kind of affective response or an affective resonance between two mm -hmm. people. And, and, and it's like, okay, so what? That, for me, that carries no moral implications. If I, if I just share your pain, I might just run away from you because I don't want to be in pain. I, and, but your notion of you know, following somebody else's journey is, a, no, no, no. I'm not just sort of in, in, uh, you know, sharing an affective state with you. That affective state is bound up with, it's facilitating and affording, trying to get deeply get, this is what I mean by perspectival knowing, mm -hmm. how you're making sense of things. That's why in the empathy circling, I like the part where you have to sort of say back to the person, I've understood you, right? It's about- Have you understood me? Yeah, you know, yeah, you're, yeah, you're getting yeah. a check. You're getting a sort of a, a yeah. message sent, message received accurately, sort of, yeah. So I think this one point we should emphasize right away, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to make connections to some of my constructs. I hope, I, I hope you find that useful. Yeah, great. I, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> so I think this idea of thinking of it more as a whole person thing, it's got serious cognitive aspects to it, and that we can think of it in terms of a, partic a, a participatory knowing, a knowing by, in some sense, identifying with people so that I can get right? I can enact for myself to some degree their perspectival knowing. I'm seeing how they're making sense uh, of a situation, how they're salience landscaping, how they're framing, how they're sizing up, also how they're identifying with that particular perspective in a participatory manner. I, I see that I'm trying to unpack, I hope you're finding this fair, mm -hmm. that yeah. follow, following somebody else's journey in, in those kinds of terms. Right. That's what I'm trying to do. It's their whole do. landscape of their whole, there's a yes. landscape of their beingness, right? It yeah, is all, yeah. this, all these things that are happening in their being, and you're, you're just sort of moving into their world, into their landscape of all the different relationships, their felt relationships, how they're putting the world together, and just sort of exploring that, and not bringing in, you're just bringing in your presence to follow yes. them to get a sense of that landscape. And it's a felt, the one thing I would I'd say is, I know there's, they, you talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the emotions and the cognitive, but it's so intertwined. Yes, I don't know total, how you total. can even, this no, whole no. thing of affective and cognitive, it's all so intertwined. I don't think you can even really clearly tease it apart. I, I, I wasn't wanting to tease it apart. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, you know, I, I argue in my series for the deep interpenetration of cognition and emotion and motivation and affect in general. I think that I think uh, what I was trying to do was I was trying to resist the reduction. I think the overly simplistic reduction of empathy to a purely 
affect it still. Right. Uh huh. Okay. That's what. Yeah. I, there's I, a I, whole I, mapping. There's a map. When you have map, you're seeing things in relationship to each other. So there is that. It's not just a felt experience, but those felt experiences have relationships to each other. So yeah. I think maybe that's what you're. That's what I'm pointing to. Yeah, uh -huh, uh, right. The, you're kind of trying to get the other person, not with just the machinery of the mind or the machinery of the heart, but if you'll allow me, sort of with the machinery of yourself. I'm trying to figure out how, if you'll allow me to turn this into a verb, I'm trying to figure out how you're sort of selfing right now, how mm -hmm. you're sort of configuring yeah. yourself and you know, co-configuring the world and trying to fit yourself in the world together. That's what I'm trying to get. And here's why I think that's important, Edwin, and I, I hope you, you think this might be um, a way I mean, I know Paul, and so... Uh, I'm okay, well, let's I, have I an empathy circle with you sometimes. <laughs> at some point. I, I, I I've been trying know. for five years to have an empathy circle. You won't talk to me. Well, I, I don't know him well. I've only, I've okay. met him and I've had a couple of conversations with him. Uh, I might be able to get a, into a conversation with him. I know he, 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 he likes my work a lot. But, so, I agree with him if, please remember the if, if empathy is just that shared affect, then I like I think it's morally neutral. But if what we mean by empathy is this sort of like enacting for myself, getting by enacting your selfing, that he has, has has huge moral implications. In fact, I can't enter into a proper moral relationship with you if I can't enactively get your selfing. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so I think that's a deep way if we understand empathy of being able to respond to that kind of critique and say, no, no, this is what we mean by empathy. We don't just mean the shared affect. Yeah. So I, well, there I is think, a, oh, sorry, go ahead. There, there, there is a feeling into like, I, I'm feeling your excitement. There right? is, right. But it's like your excitement is not like overwhelmingly and I'm just like overly, you know, lost <laughs> in your excitement, right? And that's what Bloom is criticizing. Say, oh, you're getting all excited. I'm going to get all excited. You know. Yes. Yes. So exactly. I have a sense. I'm still feeling into your being. Oh, I'm feeling you're excited. You know, what's beyond yeah. that excitement? What's What's the bigger picture? So I'm not being con so. In, in fact, if I got totally, you know, you can do that. I can get totally excited, and I lose my connection to you. Exactly. Right? I actually exactly. what Paul is criticizing. I actually agree with. That yeah. state that he is, you know, criticizing is actually, it's, it's a block to empathy as I'm sort of explaining it. So in a sense, I agree in that sense, but I don't call that empathy. He's no, that's just no. like state matching or there could be any number of reasons you get into that, that matching state. So yeah, so I just want to throw that in. No, no, I think that's good. I think what, what, I, this is why I like this idea of making sense because sense has both sort of a cognitive meaning like making sense, but it also has a sensorial meaning, like actually sensing and feeling, like you said. I'm trying to pick up on that with the, that term. And the, re the, the, the reason why I, 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 I we're circling, no mm -hmm. pun intended, on this is, you know, one of the definitions in the paper was the idea of empathy as emotional contagion, which is exactly what you were, right, uh, yeah. you were describing uh -huh. a few minutes right. ago. Uh -huh. an, emotion, an emotional contagion, as you yourself say, can actually be deeply disruptive. It can disconnect people and it can motivate them to immoral behavior. Uh, I think very clearly, mm -hmm. both That's mob kind of mm -hmm. mob uh, and, and lots of things. Yeah. So um, I think uh, trying to get um, this. I'm glad we have this forum. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get very clear on you know a conceptual reformulation of empathy that can distinguish it from these other things. I think it would be tremendously helpful. Now, so can I, I like this idea of following somebody on a journey in the way we've been talking about it, this sort of, you know, a participatory knowing of other people's perspectival knowing of getting into, getting in, feeling into, getting into, to maybe speak both sides, mm -hmm. feeling into and getting into how somebody is selfing and worlding. I, I, I see that as really important. And I, that, if I think it's also important for another reason, because this idea of getting into how somebody is selfing and worlding might help to explain why empathy can move people from bad faith to good faith dialogue. Do you, do you see what yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I, uh -huh. go, yeah, go ahead. Go I ahead. mean, you talk about bullshit. So somebody's talking bullshit and yeah. they're, they're trying to manipulate you and you just listen to the bullshit. You listen to the, to the, to the, all the different things that they're, you know, trying to throw out there. And then you just hear it. It's like, oh, I hear you're really, you know, this is going on for you. And it's almost like it disarms them. 
It's right. like, oh, you're actually listening to me. They might have anger. Oh, I hear you're, you're, you're feeling angry. Is, is there more? Like, yeah. And then you, you go into it and it's almost like it disarms. And it's like, ooh. And then they're like, oh, this feels pretty good. I'm actually being heard. And then they kind of open up. And they, there's a deeper truth, I, I find, that kind of comes up over time if you... Okay, that's, that's helpful, because now I can ask another question that might help give, give, give even more distinctive clarity. So what's the difference, because I, I think there's a difference in what you just said, between listening to someone so they're heard and listening mm -hmm. to someone and being convinced by them? Because I don't want to be convinced by the bullshit artist, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to be convinced because then the bullshit artist is that we're not going to connect. The bullshit artist is then going to manipulate me. He's going to trigger my self-deceptive machinery, my defensive machinery. So what, what are you doing? What is empathy doing that is allowing you to listen so the person feels heard without you thereby being convinced or manipulated by them if they're doing something in bad faith? Because that's what we're zeroing in now. And mm -hmm. how do we how do we get from the bad faith to the good faith? So well, what's the difference? Yeah, I, there's a, a guy named Sam Vaknin. He's, he's uh, in, in, the, in Europe, and he wrote a book called Malignant Self-Love. And he's, he's kind of the go-to guy that you go to for a narcissistic <laughs> psychopath, right? He, <laughs> right wow. he, he's created a, you know, a media persona of, of being, and there was a documentary about him that they traveled to these different research centers for studying psychopathy and they tested him. And he actually tested, you know, positive for, for this. And so I've done a couple interviews with him and I did, we did an empathy, we did a couple empathy circles and it, it's sort of amazing that it's like he kind of started opening up. I, instead of trying to manipulate me to get what he sort of wanted, you know, mm -hmm. it's like he was able to share his, what he, who he was and be heard by me. And then likewise, he, he I was, was able to be heard. He was reflecting uh, me. He was following me on my journey. And there's sort of a, there, there's sort of a, a deeper truth that comes through in, in over time with that, in that I can share well, my truth. Plus it's, it's more than just having two people. The more people you, you get, that's why yeah. like four people in the circle, you have multiple points of, of reference yeah, yeah. too. Yeah, I see that. So that yeah. creates a bit of a safety as well that if you just get with two people and they're just going back and forth, you, know, you can kind of get kind of bogged down. The more points of reference of reality okay. you have, there creates, it creates a sense of safety. I don't know if that's sort of kind of that, That's part of it. Okay, mm -hmm. the, sec the, 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 the last point you said makes good sense to me, using sort of distributed cognition and yeah. chat. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think, I think that's, and of course, th that I think overlaps with sort of uh, Socratic dialectic in important ways. Um, I, and I'm getting, I like this idea of a deeper truth. So this is, this is what it's sounding like to me. It's like, well, sometimes what people, often what people think they want in a conversation, especially if they're coming in with bad faith, is they want belief transmission. I want to give you my beliefs. Uh, that way I'll be able to predict and you control your behavior. Um, but it sounds to me like the deeper truth is almost like the Heideggerian Aletheia. What people often want and what they perhaps, well, if you'll allow me, what they really want is connectedness yeah. and, a, and a mutual opening, mm -hmm. but, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than, right, rather than, you know, belief transmission. And so is, is that the key that you listen in a way in which you're not getting locked into sort of belief transmission. You're trying to listen in a way in which you're trying to shift the person onto paying attention to that sense of connectedness, which they crave. Is yeah. that, is that a good way? Yeah. I think that you're, 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 you're talking about the meaning crisis, which is feeling disconnected, right? Yes, you have a much, sense of much. disconnected from your own real felt experience. Yes. Yes. And you have disconnection from other people's felt experience. So the empathic process of just fully hearing somebody is sort of a connection building process. Right. And that connection, right. when you start feeling connected, it's like your, your fear goes down, right? Yes. And the fear yeah. itself is a disconnecting yeah. process. Yeah. So the more we can get away past fear, the more we can sort of feel connected. And the more we feel connected, it creates a positive spiral yeah. towards deeper, deeper connection uh, over time. So yeah, a, reci a reciprocal opening as opposed yeah. to reciprocal uh -huh. narrowing. Kind yeah. of thing. So, so 
that seems to be implying, and I, I would agree with this implication, uh, that sort of one of the core underlying motives of bad faith dialogue is a kind of fear motivation. Whereas when people, uh, if they can, if you can sort of get them to connect, you, 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 you shift them from avoiding fear to pursuing connection. Um, and that's how you can shift people from uh, a bad faith dialogue, which is fear driven, to a good faith dialogue, which is connection seeking or connection cultivating. Is that? Yeah, uh, I think I think so. Yeah, it uh, it uh, you you do start over time. I mean, I, you know, we have uh, like I said, we've done left right dialogues. So uh, on you know gun control, gun violence, uh, on on um, abortion. Hey, you know, people have really strong feelings, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. easy. They share something, and if they don't feel heard, a wall goes up right? It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. They, they get tense. You can just feel the tension. And then, but it's like, okay, what I'm hearing is this, 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 you know, you're starting to hear them. And then the, they get more relaxed. Right. And right, then, right. but then, then it's, then it's, there's also the mutuality of it, at least in the empathy circle, where it's just not the other person doing all the talking. It's a mutual. So that, that feels pretty good. There's a sense of fairness within it. So that fairness within the empathy circle helps. So, right. but you're, you're but looking at so the real dynamics of what's really going on here. Well, that, it's, it's that's, that's what I want. Yeah, that's yeah. what I, 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 I mean, I, I want to, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for being such a willing participant in this. I want to bridge between um, the cognitive science and, and the practicality. I want to try and understand, you know, in terms of the, the, uh, the cognitive science, what are the cognitive processes? What are the dynamics going on? Um, because, well, I think it's, it, it would serve, uh, your practice, mm -hmm. one of the things yeah. that's happening here is a way of getting, you know, good responses to misunderstandings and misframing of empathy circling. I think that's a, a clear uh, potential benefit. Uh, but also, I think if, if I could understand, um, if you'll allow me this metaphor, the machinery of the dynamics, yeah. um, then I could relate it to other developmental processes. I could see how empathy circling as a practice could more properly coordinate with other mm -hmm. developmental processes and projects. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do with mm -hmm. you here right now. That's why I'm trying to do it. Yeah. Well, there's another piece that's coming to me now is that with there's uh, I mean, there's multiple, so many dimensions to, to this. One is the, the empathic listening was really articulated, developed within the therapeutic context, mm -hmm. right? There's, mm -hmm. The, the listener, like Carl Rogers, he would listen to his cl you know, clients and they would bring all kinds of, I mean, the, the amount of you know, struggles people have, the meaning crisis, that they're bringing their meaning crises to him. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he's just like sitting and listening. Uh, the other part that I'm looking at is the relational part. That within the therapeutic part, you, have, you're, you, you do have a bit of a distance because you've yeah. got the you've got a professional relationship yeah. the, the therapist is not equal in a sense they're right. not sharing their story so it's not a, a mutually empathic relationship so that's another part of it is that that's why i call it a culture of empathy because we want that mutual yeah. uh yeah. relation relationship part and how do we create and so the the relationship part is you can speak empathically too right it's not mm. just like listening empathically. You can contribute to the empathic relationship by speaking uh, more. And, and this was the work of Gene Genlin. I, I, yep, yep. I think focusing, you're familiar yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with yeah. the focusing. Is he like said, well, okay, who are, this, who are the, 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 the clients you know, who came? Who is moving forward in their growth, right? They're mm. stuck. They got a meaning crisis. Uh, you know, who's actually through this empathic listening, kind of having some kind of forward motion. And from his studies, it was like the people who spoke from a felt present, mm. felt experience, like, oh, right now I'm feeling excited. I'm feeling mm. concentration. I'm, you know, mm. and the concentration mm. is right here. I feel kind of a spaciousness here. Right, and right, doing right, right. it moment to moment, too. It's like, oh, it's actually changing just by my sharing the felt experience kind of it starts shifting and mm -hmm. then you get a reflection on it and that kind of contributes to the shifting. And so his insight was, it was the felt experience and identifying it, you know, sharing it, getting the reflection on it versus kind of spinning in sort of an intellectual, right, you right, know, right, sort right. of a detached 
mm -hmm. way that you're in sort of a monotone, continuous sort of a monotone space. You just don't move anywhere. Yes. So right. that was sort of his, and he kind of developed that whole uh, kind of a structure. That's helpful. So the so now I'm getting a sense of uh, the uh, the the appropriate let's call it uh, the empathy conducive kind of listening, and now you said but it has to be properly conjoined with an empathy conducive kind of speaking, yeah. and get, uh, getting them to resonate properly together is is part of the challenge I take it. Yeah, and you can deepen. That's what it takes to sort of deepen the experience, even at a super you know at that sort of just more bad faith or whatever level, you know. Right, right. It already it does a lot. You know, it it over time, you know, we do like family empathy circles, four hours of this empathic yeah, listening. Yeah. And you know, it it kind of people are kind of disjointed and after, you know, about two hours, a little bit more, something clicks and people are sort of you just kind of feel this kind of connection that that happens. So. Yeah, I, I take it that what happens is you get so, sort of this self-organizing system that takes shape. I've noticed that in other uh, other circling practices, you get sort of this, you know, people, are, people feel sort of static or, or just, you know, this kinds of one-off connections. And it's like you say, it's sort of all propositional. And then it shifts into, no, no, no. Now we're all sort of belonging to this self-organizing system that's starting to take on a life of its own. And people start to... Uh, the, I noticed that the, the metaphors shift from sort of pushing effort to being drawn. People start to say, I was, you know, they do, I'm saying this, and they sort of push their hand out. They do all these pushing metaphors. And then when mm, the shift mm -hmm. turns, they, ah, go, they go into, uh -huh. I'm, being, I'm being drawn in, I, uh -huh. I carried along, and, and they start to, and so they, 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 they to use a Buddhist metaphor, they, they feel that they've entered the stream, right? That uh -huh. they found a way to orient themselves into the process so that then they now start to get carried along. So I'm very, I'm very interested in that. I'm, I'm trying to see uh, what are the conditions that uh, make, make that gel and take shape. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, starting to do work with a, a student um, about trying to maybe come up with, um, you know, a way of operationalizing this and measuring this so we can see where you get that transition, where it goes from sort of chaotic to then a co coherent so self-organization. Um, uh, yeah, there's a real felt experience in that. You can, yes, you're, very you're, much. You're, there's a like you're saying, there's a feeling of pushing versus a feeling of being drawn into it, and exactly, and you're exactly. being yeah, it's like being in sort of a flow, and there's more of a yeah, harm, yeah. A, a, yeah. a harmony of the whole that kind of happens. That, that and how do you kind of create that environment? Yeah. So, so part of the theorizing that I'm doing is um, is that I think that w what seems to be happening is that. Uh, Within distributed cognition, you're getting you're getting a shared flow state in, in the Csikszentmihalyi sense of the word. You're actually getting the you're getting people in sort of distributed, mutually reinforcing flow. And so I'm I'm wondering if you know the conditions that create individual flow, how did that map onto uh, you know creating this collective flow? Uh, it's interesting that because uh, I've been, been in some circling events and I've been reading about it um, that. Um, uh, the, the people often they 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 get the, this like this third factor that in addition to all the people there's the conversation mm -hmm, or the process mm -hmm, or even mm -hmm. even the spirit that, and they start to feel sort of a relationship to the process and the spirit of the process above and beyond but not excluding of the other participants in the process and i get a sense from what you're just saying that, that that's also happening when you get into the deeper levels of empathy circling do, do people start to talk that way as if they're being sort of carried along and the conversation itself is starting to direct them or lead them yeah i've i found there's a there's a state where you don't even do empathic listening and you don't do the reflection anymore it's like it's already embodied sort of that yeah. we already know that we're listening to each other, right? We already know that right. we're taking each other in, so we don't even do the reflective listening anymore. And I kind of like that that state because there's a kind of a shift that happens. And then I kind of feel ah, I ah. feel comfortable and at ease because I'm not having to be on guard, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> on guard about what's being said. Is there going to be space for me? Uh, and then yeah, I've heard that. So it is sort of like this, I've, some people have mentioned sort of a third space, you know, there's me, yes, you, yeah. and this third sort of a space. The, the third that, space, yeah, exactly. It kind yeah. of happens, and, and how do we create that, and how do we deepen it, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I, I, those are good questions. And those are questions I'm trying to get a, a handle on. Um, I, and I'm also interested in that because when people I've seen and I've read about and I've experienced it, uh, that when people start to get a sense of that third space, they're, they're, some of their, they start to shift. Right? And I want to be really careful here. And I don't want it be, I don't want this to be over read. I'm like, uh, but people, they start to use spiritual and religious language to mm -hmm. talk about this, this space. Uh, and it makes sense because you're sort of involving the whole self. And then the whole self is in relation to other people's whole selves. And then all these whole selves are sort of in relation to this third space. And it, 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 I, I'm interested in, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, the spiritual aspects of these practices too. Because I think that's also the way in which they address the meaning crisis. They give people a way of not believing in propositions about spirituality, but actually enacting the self-transcendence and the deep connectedness that's at the core of, I think, a lot of meaning making and the cultivation of wisdom, of spirituality, to put an umbrella term on it. I wonder what, what do you think about that? Do you, do you oh. think it, it, it starts to, because that's another aspect of addressing the meaning crisis, right? Giving people a place like a temple or a church, if you'll allow me the analogy, mm -hmm. where they can go so that they can, ex not, they can enact self-transcendence. They can enact deep connectedness. They can enact transformation they can enact an awareness of something more comprehensively connective than just their own egoic self yeah i think i, I heard one of your your uh, dialogues that you had of a evangelical uh, fundamentalist background yeah so yes, do i right. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, well, there you go there you go that, that explains so much <laughs> yeah so yeah so I, so for me, you know, I grew up, I thought I knew, understood everything, you know, I, I was yeah. going to go to heaven. I, I had the kind of the answers. Then I spent 10 years traveling around the world, right? Yeah. Muslim <laughs> countries, Hindu, you know, animist and, and just wide variety. And all that kind of just, you know, kind of passed away to where I kind of, I just saw that what well, people are kind of people. If I was born here, I'd kind of be a Muslim. If I was born here I'd be a Hindu or whatever just right, because I would, right. would have taken on the, the culture and then I just saw that the, there was sort of this common humanity you know people just they're kind they're generous they're caring they're they're not so caring you know yeah. so so I, I just see it more spirituality is more just felt experience so mm -hmm. if you're saying spirituality that there is a felt experience of you know, if you say transcendent, something, you know, moving yep. beyond. Getting unstuck. Getting unstuck. Right? Getting, getting unstuck. unstuck. Yeah. You know, getting that's unstuck. What I mean. uh -huh. That's what I mean by self-transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, again, it, it, again, if we, if like, I think what's going on um, is people, a felt experience of getting unstuck, but also a felt experience of making connections and making meaning. And again, not propositional meaning. I mean, the meaning in life kind of meaning, the kind of where we, we sense that we're connected very deeply to ourselves, to other people, to reality in important ways. The things, you know, that the research is showing is, you know, are really conducive to people feeling they have a lot of meaning in life. Um, and that's what I mean by spirituality in mm -hmm. that sense. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I just use the word felt experience to be mm. spirituality somehow has the sense of it being another world. I mean, beyond. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's no, not no. part of the physical experience. There's something like God who's in a different dimension that's outside of the, the sphere. Yeah, no, no, um, no, no. I, uh, I, I, I understand your criticism. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I think we have to. Uh, I, I sometimes would use the word sapiential rather than spiritual, meaning having to do with wisdom in this broad sense of really understanding, you know, how to connect um, with other people, with yourself and other people in the world, and really cultivate um, a, a depth in that connection. Um, yeah, something that, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just, want, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to, thank you for letting me finish. I appreciate that. I just wanted to say that, I guess part of the way I see the project that I've been engaging is, is to try and reconstruct the notion of spirituality, make it more oriented to sapiential, because I want to take it out of that two worlds grammar that you, you just pointed to. Because many people I like you, they don't find that two worlds grammar of the here and then there's the other world of heaven or God. They don't find that two worlds grammar viable anymore it's not a live option for them and if spirituality is bound up with that that's why the, that's why you i would argue that's why you see a lot of people rejecting 
the established religions because that grammar doesn't work for them anymore for all kinds of historical and I think scientific reasons. But if can we take whatever it was that was going on there that afforded people what I call religio, that deep sense of connectedness, that affordance of getting unstuck, self-transcendence, growth in meaning in life, can we bring it into a, a, another way of thinking that doesn't rely on the two world grammar? I think that's what I'm trying to point to. I think that mm -hmm. part of what empathy circling and these other modalities are doing is exactly that. They're trying to say, we don't need that. We don't need that, that, that mythos anymore. There's another way in which we can enact the, these, these uh, ex what you call the felt uh, the felt experience of connectedness. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, how do you create that sense of connectedness without having to think of God and, and some yes. kind of a outside worldly sort of space? And, otherworldly, uh, yeah, yeah, otherworldly. yeah, exactly. And I think that's what Carl Rogers, if you, you know, if like that paper of his, he's kind of addressing that. It's like he's talking about people getting stuck. I mean, that was yes. his whole work was like people are coming, I am stuck in, I'm stuck in, in disconnection, alienation, depression, yep. Uh, yep. anxiety, fear. I mean, you just go down the list of all these feelings that people get sort of stuck in. And he's like, well, just through the listening to people, for them to start opening up, start sharing their felt experience, and for that to be seen, there's something about the, having someone there to reflect you, to be sort of on the yep. journey with you, metaphorically, yeah, yeah. I'm on the journey with you to follow you on your journey. And there's something about that companionship that creates a sense of connection, even in the darkest, you know, yep, yep, you yep, see yep, people yep. who just collapse. Like I just, they collapse with grief or whatever. And there's someone there that has their arms around that person sort of being present with them. And it's a support in, in that, that moment. Yep, right. Uh, so it's, I think that's sort of the, the empathic presence that how it helps the unstuck that it's like as you slowly go in and I've had that experience. I, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but with um, uh, I, I was kind of just noticing my own anxiety and, and yeah. I was in a dance. I do freestyle dance. Right. So right I was right. noticing it and I, I thought, well, instead of just avoiding it going off and away, I'm going to really try to tap in. I'm going to try to take that anxiety that I feel kind of in the core of my body and I want to zoom in on it like, like a picture. You know, like when, and when you zoom into yeah. a picture, you get right, to right, the right, individual right, right. pixels. I said, I want to zoom into this and get into the individual pixels and see what it is. And, and, I, and as I did that, I started getting metaphors came to mind. Like, oh, it's like thousands mm. of little knives that are cutting away, slicing away at me. And I'm going to get really close to that. And as I got really, I kept, you know, kind of exploring it, it, it kind of dissolved that feeling yeah, dissolved right. in a yeah. new and it was like oh this is kind of there's there's no it's gone and then it was only a few seconds later that oh i have another one there's like this heaviness in my mind kind of a heavy cloud so it was kind of met it turned into and then i started going into that and for like an hour mm -hmm. i just kind of kept dancing into looking for the fears and anxieties and i would kind of get as close as i could and and it's like going into them, it's like they would kind of open up and sort of dissolve. And at the end of a, an hour, I felt like I was, I mean, I was like in heaven. It was like, I was just so calm. I was just so, it's like, oh, this space of just, it's like, it, talking about transcendence. You know, it was yeah. like, it just felt so good to have kind of trans, trans you know, tr gone through all of these these fears. I think that's what the pre the empathic presence does. It allows you that that you're you're not going alone on that journey into these different feelings. So I so, guess I'm I'm tying that in with the spirituality. For me, that was no, a, totally, like totally, felt, totally, I, yeah, spiritual transformative, yeah. Trans, yeah. That's good because I think there's a both an individual, or you might call it a therapeutic aspect to meeting crisis, but I think there's also a cultural aspect. And so that's what I'm trying to bridge with this notion of spirituality. We need a better term, but we need something. Yes, people need sort of individual ways of getting unstuck, but there's also, people also have a sense of being sort of culture shock, experiencing culture shock within this culture, like not feeling at home in the culture at large, a kind of collective domicile. And I think part of that is they're looking for, I mean, I think there's evidence to support this. They're looking for ways, not because they're in 
what you might call it, you know, any kind of psychological uh, distress. This is much more an existential. They're looking for ways to afford this connection. And I, I mean, that's your intent, right? You, empathy isn't just for people who are in therapeutic distress. It's supposed to be also something that's more existentially uh, powerful and relevant. Is, is that is that? Oh, is yeah. That I'm, I'm looking for cultural transformation. My yeah, idea right. is that if we, and this is just one tool, the em empathy circle is something that can be trans, you know, can go into the full culture. And I really am serious about you know, what I want to do, I've been working with the Extinction Rebellion, you know, the environmental yeah. group, because I really yeah. like the nonviolent direct action. I'm, I, I'm wanting to do empathic direct action, where right. we like set up our empathy. I've got all these empathy tents, and we've, we've got them in different countries, too. We set up on the Capitol Mall, you know, in front of the Congress, and we say, we demand that the the, the, the Republicans and Democrats do empathy circles with each other. <laughs> we, and it, it, it's like, That's I mean, the way, the, the, the way I see it is, the metaphorically is, it's kind of like World War I, right? You got the social structure, which is, uh, you know, uh, is a kind of authoritarian, uh, colonial, aristocratic, hierarchical, hierarchical structure. Right. You got the soldiers, working with each other and then you got the nurses and doctors trying to help like oh that's great but it's not those nurses and doctors aren't transforming the yeah, overall the social structure yeah, yeah so it's like how do we yeah. take this sort of mindset and bring it into the core of the social structure you know the political social structures right, right, right. and so we we camp out you know there on the capitol mall and we got these empathy tents. I don't know if you've seen the, the tents that we, we've got. We, we no, actually, I have it. Oh, I'll have to send you the links. Please, so, please do. So we, 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 you know, the political right comes to Berkeley and then the political left, Antifa and so forth, you know, come and they kind of battle it out uh, here. Yeah. And we have this, you know, small group. We have an empathy tent. We set it up kind of in the middle of that. We offer listening to both sides and also sort of mediation between the sides. So we've got sort of the machinery That's for, cool. for setting That's this cool. up. Yes. And so we got the tools. So I'm kind of working towards that, you know, capital mall yeah. kind of right. <laughs> That's that, That's action. great. So that, that goes towards like my, my concern about the sort of sapiential spiritual mm -hmm. aspects of this, about that it's not just a therapeutic transformation. Right. It's a much more comprehensive existential and cultural transformation that you're seeking. So I think you answered that question very well. I also see in the way you were describing the dancing, uh, and I, I mean, this is also in Genlin's work, right? That there's, you know, training and mindfulness could interact with things like empathy circling. They could mutually improve and benefit each other I think in some very powerful ways. So, I, you know, in other ways, I'm trying to, I'm seeing how empathy circling could fit into a larger ecology of practices. So that example was particularly helpful to me. So thank you. For yeah, that. It, it is thinking, but I think that's what you're trying to do. You're really trying to do cultural transformation and kind exactly. of create the tool set and a, and a map for how can this cultural transformation take part is kind of yeah. what I'm, I'm getting. Because that's the, the, totally culture, right. the culture itself, the whole dynamics of the, of the mutuality is, ha is having that crisis of yes yeah I agree where, where, where do we go from here things are falling apart there's polarization yeah. you know we're not solving climate crisis etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah 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 right so we're not only stuck as individuals right we're we're stuck as a culture in, in an important way and so um, I, and I I, I want to understand. Well, I, you've helped to address that. How, how, what's the connection between the individual level of practice and the more comprehensive level? And I see what you're trying to do. That's, that's extremely cool. Um, I think at some point I, I would like to talk with you again. Yeah, uh, it'd be it, great. Because maybe a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, uh, today is a, a day of, of, of like four or five interviews for me. So I, I'm sort of chuck a block. Um, but, um, well, I, I think it, it's. It, I mean, I think we made some good progress in this. Mm, I love but, it. Yeah, mm. getting things clear, and mm. I would really like to talk um, to you again. And we let's do what we did before. We let, we will have this. Let's try and build on it. Have another uh, discussion. Maybe yeah, I'll set aside an hour and a half for our next discussion, Edwin. And let's try and also do what we did, like email about how we might go forward and extend, because I think that really got us very quickly into mm -hmm. a really good discussion. I would also like, um, I mean, you'll obviously put this on your channel. I'm wondering if you could uh, 
you know, send me a Google Drive this, and I could upload it onto my channel. That would be great. Yeah, yeah because yeah. You, I think you'd have to get much more distribution. I can put it on Facebook if you want to put it on YouTube. I think we, your channel well, would get uh, much yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it on my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and I can also tweet about it and uh, post on it in LinkedIn, and so I can sort of broadcast it more, more, wi more widely. So like I said, if you'll send me the link, uh, through like uh, Google Drive or mm -hmm. Dropbox or something, uh, then I'll I'll look to upload it on my channel in the next couple of days. Then okay, great, yeah, that I'm really excited. It's just the beginning of a. But but, but I found it. Yeah. I thought it was very. I thought it was uh -huh. very productive though. I thought we 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 sort of unpacked things sort of quite well. At least initially, yeah. start to start getting at some of the depths. Right, like I said, starting to build some connections between the the cognitive science and, and the practice. Uh, and I also that the happened. space of how we do it too. I did yes. This yeah. space that you create, it's like this warm, inviting, <laughs> like a bathtub, <laughs> a warm, inviting bathtub. <laughs> well, uh, you reciprocated uh, that space very, very nicely. Uh, so, uh, again, thank you. We will definitely talk again. Um, please, uh, like I said, send me uh, uh, the file and I'll upload it to my channel. It's been okay, great. great. We're going to talk yeah. again for sure. Look forward uh, and to thanks it. again. Thanks again. Thank